And welcome back to another Sam Bids Live episode, number 54, where we walk through small business solicitations together on Sam.gov and answer your questions along the way so that you too can start bidding and winning contracts on Sam.gov for your small government contracts business. Today, we will be reviewing five small business solicitations that I've pulled up on Sam that we will be jumping into in just a second. But if you are new here and you don't want to miss future Sam Bids Live episodes, make sure you subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell so that you can ask your questions live on future streams. And lastly, guys, if you're just starting out and you're wanting to middleman government contracts the legal way, our new book, The Legal Middleman Method, is out and available for purchase finally. So if you want to learn to middleman government contracts legally, check out the book at our website, legalmiddleman.com slash book. Or you can take it one step further and get more than 40 legal middleman training videos, along with all the templates you need for writing proposals, working with subs, or even choosing from dozens of CAPE statements, all included in the LMM course that you can check out at legalmiddleman.com slash course. And if you're saying, hey, Derek, I don't know if this middleman stuff exactly applies to me or if that's the only thing that I want to do, does this is this still going to help me? Does this still apply? Yes, it 100% does and will because you still need to learn how to bid contracts either way, no matter what your strategy is, even if you're self-performing contracts. And that is a large portion of the book and the course. So just like our Sam Bids Live show does not only apply to middle manning, the book and the course are a great fit for everybody that's trying to learn the space and apply it to their new GovCon businesses. So hello and welcome everybody. Thanks for hanging out with us today. If you're alive, let us know that you are live in the chat. Let me know which state you are representing. And also, if this is your first time being on the live show, let me know this is your first time as well. And we already have the comments pouring in. What we're going to do is I'm going to give you a quick sneak peek of the bids we're going to be covering today. And then we'll go ahead and check in with the chat. And then from there, we will also go ahead and get started with our first bid. So bid number one that we will be covering today in just a few moments is janitorial services out of Beverly National Cemetery. Bid number two, we have a BPA out of Fort Meade, Maryland. This is for lodging accommodations. Bid number three is for electronics message boards. Might actually be a product buy, which we don't do a whole lot of on the show. So we'll see what that looks like. We also have bid number four, locksmith repair services and support maintenance. And then also number five, regulated waste removal and sharps removal. So again, we will go ahead and get started with those very, very soon. I want to go ahead and welcome everybody to the show. We got everything by John Bro Salute. Looking for my third contract win. Dude, that's awesome. I need some bad. Uh, sounds like you got your first two in the books. A great way to start the year if you're coming into the year with those wins. Congratulations. I'm sure win number three is not far behind. Jalen Scott hanging out with us from San Diego, California. Welcome. Essence of uh, Eminis is live. Welcome. Welcome. LLC Leon, first time. Welcome for a first timer uh, from Tulsa, Oklahoma. We have uh, Sheree Juno from New Orleans, not too far from me. Hopefully I pronounced that right as well. Welcome. We got Ethel hanging out from Alabama, where I'm currently as well. Ethel Robinson, welcome, welcome. Ohio State SD Cleaners, welcome. Miss Red Nose Pit out of Georgia, my first time. Awesome, guys. We got Larry Ducray on LinkedIn, nonetheless, also out of Love Hampton, Virginia. What's going on? We have uh, Oluwasan, Austin, Texas, first time. Hopefully, I'm pronouncing this properly. Welcome. We got uh, Hyun Hodge, DMV area. Uh, looks like DC, Maryland, Virginia, first time. Awesome. Hopefully, I'm doing okay with these names. Uh, a lot of new timers here as well, guys. Welcome. So awesome to see it. Lloyd uh, Massingill, um, Atlantic Business Ventures out of West Palm Beach. Amazing. Latifa Hicks, awesome, beautiful day, everyone. Beautiful day to you as well, Latifa, from Virginia. We have Zinariah Smith, first time. Guys, so many first timers, I love it. We have uh, Obo Gudeta, I read your book. Do I need a business license after getting LLC to do government contracting? Um, business licenses is different than government contracting, but we can get to questions in a little bit. But just for government contracting, um, business licenses are not, it depends on the scope of work that you're doing, right? And then how you're going to fulfill that work. So just as a blanket thing, do I need a business license? No, you have to have a registered business. And you also have to have a business that's technically formally set up for your state and the IRS if you're in the United States, right? And then you bring that to the federal space, i.e. 
through getting a cage code, getting your UEI number, et cetera. Um, awesome, awesome, everybody. Glad to have you guys all here. Timothy says, ready to start class tomorrow. Yes, we're starting our LMM class tomorrow as well. So super excited to be working with everybody who signed up for the winter semester. It kicks off officially tomorrow. Um, I think it's time we go ahead and get started. I'm just, we got so many things going on and I'm just so, so excited. And like I tell you guys all the time, I'm not joking when I look forward to this all week long. Um, like the, I th the first comment today, <laughs> looking forward to my third win. Like this is the stuff that energizes me, guys. I love it. So bid number one, janitorial services, Beverly National Cemetery. This is out of the VA. This is due February 12th. And this is SDVOSB consistent with the, uh, the vets first for the VA um, set aside contracts. So SDVOSB, not total small. The con uh, janitorial services... Contractor shall furnish all personnel, supervision, transportation, equipment, and supplies necessary to perform the janitorial services at the janitorial uh, Beverly National Cemetery. Performance consists of daily, monthly, semi-annually, and as needed, cleaning of approximately uh, 4,000 square foot. So it gives us already a nice little idea of what we're getting into, although it's janitorial and most of us probably have a decent idea of what that looks like. But if you're new, you, you might not. So uh, that's why it's good to cover everything. In terms of our attachments, just reading these titles gives us a, a pretty good idea of what we're in for as well. We have the formal solicitation. We have a past performance questionnaire, a PPQ attachment. So we know that they're going to be requesting past performance. We have a wage determination. We have a statement of work. And then we have a, a price cost schedule, which I would like to actually start with first because a picture is worth a thousand words very often. So this is just two pages. And to zoom in a little bit, we see this is base and option years. So we can quickly do the count. Well, I mean, we don't even have to, it's telling us right here, base plus four. So this is a nice stackable contract. This would be an example of something uh, per se that we talk about with legal middle manning. If you're wanting to, you know, like a, uh, I give the example of, you know, real estate agents or maybe even more so insurance agents where they have an agency and they stack contracts year on year for multiple contract, you know, years of obligation, which means work that you did a year ago could be paying off two years from now. So as you continue to win contracts, you know, five, 10 contracts a year, maybe just two or three a year, whatever it is for you, if those are option year contracts, Imagine if you just say you win three a year, year one, you win three, year two, you win three, but then you also have three because you're performing on the option year. So now you're billing out for six, year three, you'll be billing out for nine, et cetera, et cetera. It gets very exciting. And um, this is not a, uh, GovCon is absolutely not any sort of a get rich scheme or anything like that. I mean, those of you who follow me know that um, I'm the last person to ever say anything like that. We're really looking at the one to two year window to get things up and going just like any other business in the commercial space but with that being said taking this particular strategy stacking services building a book of business it gets really exciting at years two three and four because of that stacking even compounding if you will right um so we can see that here i'm just this is a great table to illustrate that because it's very simple so i wanted to take a, an extra minute to explain it in that way also since we're in the spirit of our LMM class starting tomorrow. That's just a hint of what we'll be touching on. So pricing here will be calculated monthly and you have a unit cost and a total cost. So it'll just be month times 12 for the base and all option years. In terms of the service here, it's pretty much that same statement that we saw in the sam.gov link, just providing all personnel, supervision and equipment um, relating to the statement of work. And that's just gonna be pretty much copy and pasted unless, yeah, I don't see anything broken out for like stripping and waxing the floors once or twice a year. I don't see that. I just see everything rolled into one year, 12 months at a time. So pretty straightforward, I would say, which, which I like, because if you can get a bearing on what makes sense, you can bring that into more complicated bids. They're giving us PPQ, as I mentioned, just take a, a quick glance at this one page. 
typical um, pass performance information that would be requested. Uh, anytime you provide pass performance, it's going to be information similar to this. And they're looking for uh, at least three contracts over the last five years. Uh, like the two R's, we always say recency and relevancy is really what they're getting at here with the pass performance questionnaire. We have wage determination, the statement of work. And we're, I guess we're actually getting to the solicitation last today. So the statement of work is only nine pages, so not too bad. They're giving us some site visit information with the POCs to contact. You must contact one of these, right? So it's not, doesn't look like it's gonna be a group site visit. It's just gonna be, you know, one and done, um, whoever wants to go. I don't see the, the date and time that's cut off, but that's something we would wanna look for. Um, the reiterating, reiterating rather here, base plus four option year contract, and then the actual scope of service. So again, square footage, location, approximate areas of the floors, all great information with you, or if you're gonna be working with a subcontractor, teaming partner on this, this is the type of information that's definitely gonna be flow down because you wanna make sure there are no scope back, scope gaps, make sure there's no break or difference in between what work is gonna be fulfilled and performed and then what the contract is asking. And the way to make sure that is seamless is to literally flow down all the information that's being asked of you to either your employee or your teaming partner, whether you're self-performing or you're subcontracting, right? It's another way to say it. And then lastly, we do have the solicitation and there we'll just look for response requirements, evaluation factors, things like that. As long as my computer doesn't uh, crash on me. There we go. Has anybody, uh, side question, side question for you. Has anybody tried Starlink? Starlink is the Elon Musk satellite internet. I've tried it over this weekend, had some problems with it, trying to get more dependable service. Just personal, <laughs> shameless uh, question here. Has anybody tried Starlink? Let me know what your experience has been in the chat if you have. And if you don't know what it is and you're in a remote area, uh, definitely check it out for yourself. My results have been not the most dependable. So I'm trying to gather additional information. So we have our instruction offers here in the solicitation. They're giving us company information to fill out. They're calling that volume A. Offers shall submit quotes in four separate Adobe Acrobat uh, PDF documents, right? Volumes A, B, C, and D. Offers who fail to do that will not be considered responsive. Or the, you'll be considered non-responsive rather you wouldn't be submitting a compliant bid. So it's super important. Um, they're even including uh, the request for a CAPE statement in here. Now, do you always submit a CAPE statement with your bid? Absolutely not. You only give it to them when they ask for it, which is actually not that often. So this is an example where uh, we do see it being requested, which is why I like to point it out. But in addition to that, volume A company info is part of your proposal response. We have volume B. What is that? Technical proposal. People say, Derek, what do I give in uh, the proposal response? Do I just fill out the SF 1449 form? Just give them pricing? Do I just give them what I think, you know, I have, which is like, you know, my company write up, maybe you have a commercial business and you have a typical, you know, RFQ, RFP format that you use. Do I just submit that with my price and let contracting dissect through it? No, absolutely not. As we just read, you will be found to be um, non-compliant, right? So you have to take this information and I always recommend using this info to build an outline so that then you can answer these plug and chug and that builds out and fleshes out your actual proposal. And then by the time you're done with all that, you're like 70, 80% done. Then you just come back and plug and chug. Uh, maybe you need to do research. Maybe you need to you know work with your employee to get more technical jargon, or you need to work with a teaming partner or a subcontractor uh, to get additional information to put into your proposal technically. But those are kind of like the steps, right? Start with what they give you. That way, you know, you're not giving them extra. And what you are giving them is precisely what they want. And it's going to flow in the order that they want it. Um, and then by the time you're done, like I said, 
you can really you can really focus on like your pricing strategy and then it gives you the opportunity to look at the evaluation factors of what's most important if there are certain sections that are more important than others for example in a best value bid you can't even worry about any of that to strategically try to win and improve if you're still struggling or if you're brand new at putting responses together right so that's what we focus here on the show big tangent i know uh but that's that's me and that's how I am. So again, technical proposal, volume B, they're saying the contractor's capability statement, not to exceed 20 pages. You might say, Derek, volume A, they've asked for capability statement. They sure did. So guess what? I'm giving it to them twice. Maybe they're tripping over their words, but we're not going to be non-compliant. So, okay. We are the main thing here is they're saying it should not be a copy paste or restatement directly from the solicitation but they do want it customized and tailored to the requirement we have a work plan staffing plan as part of this we have key personnel we have list of equipment or vehicles and also they want a gantt chart go figure all volume b past performance volume c we already seen the ppq and they are referencing that here and then volume d pricing pricing uh, proposed pricing shall be submitted on the pricing sheet that we already walked through. Remember the 12 months and the base plus option years? Yep, that's what they want filled out. So I like this because the information is very straightforward. Then for you as a bid, no bid decision, you will have to decide based on this, even after based on reading this for five minutes, is this something that you want to respond to? Is this something you think you can be competitive in responding to that would make it worth essentially your, your time and investment of time and resources to try to go after this. So now we do have some uh, clauses and reps and certs. And I'm just looking to see if we do have evaluation factors. And we do. Technical, past, performance, and price. Go figure. That's going to be consistent with our four volumes. They are saying price and other factors considered. They are referencing best benefit represents the best as a whole. It looks to me that is more of a best value evaluation. I'm not seeing anything that indicates the lowest price only. And I also couple that with what they're asking for in the proposal. Um, those don't really seem like specific areas that would just be checking a box like you would see in an LPTA bid, lowest price bid only, where the other factors are only pass fail. It, it looks like contracting is looking to use these technical and past performance factors as as more of a weighting as opposed to simply just checking the box so i do believe that this is a best value bid which means the lowest price is not necessarily going to win contracting is going to be using these other uh factors and volumes a through d um inclusive of price but also aside from price to consider who is going to win this contract ultimately take all that into account when deciding whether or not you want to bid and again if you think you can win do it if not Maybe table it and see if you can find something better because there's always an opportunity cost for any decision you make, especially if it's you, you and your partner, you and your spouse, you and uh, an intern, right? Anybody, you don't have a lot of time to go around. You're very limited in delegation. And that's why I stress so hard on this. And really, you know, without saying it, these are, these are systems, like building these simple systems in your business, not only allow you to be efficient, but also allows you to uh, have the feedback to monitor, analyze, essentially get better over time, which is the way that you do anything, including learn to ride a bike or all that good stuff. So that was a long bid review. Hopefully there were some nuggets in there for you. Let me see if I can pick up with the chat though and take a second for a break. Contractors apprenticeship. First Live St. Louis, welcome, welcome. Gene Sims, this is my first lives. Uh, Georgette Gene Enterprises, management consulting in project and real estate management. Awesome. Shanty B, good afternoon, good afternoon. We've got uh, our first timers and we also have a, a number of recurring community members as well, which we always love to see. Everything by John says, yes, those wins were last summer, though. So we're due. We're definitely due. And last summer was what? The busy season? So you're you're primed now. So you'll be able to really lean into 
through the second and third quarters leading up to the fourth quarter this year, because now you're you're riding off the tails of of all that. Awesome, guys. Miss Redno says, is this for be beginners? It's absolutely for beginners. I would say it's beginners to intermediate. Um, I don't know how much value there is for the advanced folks, um, but beginner to Im intermediate, I would say get a, a good amount of value from this. And I think the value really comes through repetition, watching multiple episodes um, or, or using this as a live training over a period of months, because you're going to hear me say a lot of the same things over again which is going to help you to build a skill set and kind of get into your, your subconscious so that you don't have to overly think about everything. You can just kind of move without thinking within like reading solicitations and thinking about things. But then, you know, it's probably like, I don't know, 70 to 80% repetition from each episode. And then 20% kind of new stuff I try to, to pull in so that you're still constantly growing and being exposed to new things uh, in the way, in the amount of bandwidth that doesn't kind of overwhelm you. So if you're a brand new, this could be overwhelming. But um, hopefully the show is designed in a way to make it something that you believe you can do because we've had so many folks on the show, maybe in the community, you guys can even let them know um, that have maybe won a contract as a result of watching this show or have made some level of significant progress from where they were starting to where they are now because of just staying on top of the episodes with the show. So absolutely for, for newbies. Um, let's go ahead and look at our second bid, guys. and keep the uh, questions coming. I'll do my best. I can't get to everybody, but, um, but for the interest of time, I'll do my best to get to everybody's um, questions and as well as our our format and bids for the show. So bid number two, Fort Meade, Maryland, lodging accommodations. This is Air Force Material Command. January 26th due date, small business set aside, 721110 hotels, NICS code. Again, lodging and accommodations. This is going to be out of Annapolis. And I think I, yeah, this is this is a BPA. I think I might have mentioned it when I first did the, um, the sneak peek. BPA, blanket purchase agreement. This is a vehicle. Whoever wins on this, it can be a single award or multiple award, will be on a pre-vetted vehicle. When you win a BPA, I actually did a short on this earlier this week. Uh, you don't per se win a direct contract. Like it's not directly correlated to dollars, the BPA is basically a ticket to play the game, which means you will then have access to future task orders, which can be really good because that means it's not going to be a one and done. It's going to be, okay, we need this, we need that, we need that. Pricing for this, pricing for this, pricing for that. And you will be allowed to because your pricing and your initial proposal will already have been submitted and accepted, which will allow you access. And if you're a single award, that means you're the only one on the BPA. That means you'll be going after all these without any arguable competition, right? Contracting could always still take it outside of the BPA. Sometimes we see this and bid it separately. But the whole point for them is to have a more streamlined procurement process that they don't have to do that. So they really only do that if they they feel like it's a overwhelming amount of work they're throwing your way and they question if you could um, you know, perform that amount or if you're just not handling the work that they're throwing you, um, they're certainly not going to kind of screw themselves over. But if all is going well in terms of fulfillment and ordering, they're going to feed you as much work as you basically can handle at your capacity. So why BPAs can be really good, but they are different from like a standard contract. And that's, that's the distinction here. Okay, so I think we can just actually take a look at the attached documents. We have a solicitation, statement of work, and a price sheet. Most of you know I like to work backwards. Let's go ahead and start with the price sheet. It's technically backwards, but for me, in my mind, it's forwards. Because I, I like to back into things. That way I feel like I'm not missing anything. So one page, even more straightforward than the previous document. Prices will be evaluated on a TEP, total evaluated price. And that will be determined by the unit price per day for the single rooms, plus the per day for the double, they're calling the double occupancy rooms, equals TEP. This price list provided shall be good for one year. 
because this is the pricing you're going to submit and it's the pricing that they're going to use. Again, if you get on that blanket agreement, like in that vehicle inside the BPA, they're going to go to these pre-submitted and accepted rates. That's the whole point of pre-vetting to begin with. That way they know what they're paying ahead of time. So you would just put your unit price here for Fridays and Saturdays, and then your when available, they're calling as needed for here. And the distinction they're making is eight and a half mile drive from the Annapolis Junction in Maryland. So you can pull that up on a map and you will find there's going to be only so many providers, right? To provide that. And that's where you're going to arguably look to for fulfillment because they are largely dictating that by putting a relatively short drive distance on it. I.e., I think contracting knows what they want. It's nudge, nudge, wink, wink. You know, we know what we want. You got to give it to us, but like, what's it's got to be competitive. It's got to be fair. It's got to be reasonable. And then we're going to work. It's kind of like if we're Bob Ross painting the picture with the happy little trees, like this is what we're doing here. Okay. We got a happy little mountain going up. By the way, um, I love Bob Ross. So I grew up um, kind of learning to paint following his videos. And I haven't painted in many, many years, but I love to paint. And I've never shared that before on the show. So I love painting landscape and things like that. So for those of you who know me for a while, that's something that you didn't know about me. I also have a Bob Ross bobblehead up there. I don't, you probably can't see it. Okay, so we did open up our scope of work. And we're just looking for any details that will go along with that pricing sheet that they gave us. So we're seeing lodging facility, location, fire and safety requirements. These are requirements, minimums, that whatever uh, space you're proposing will have to meet. For example, double occupancy room shall contain at least two beds, right? These are the basic sufficiencies. Telef a telephone in good operational condition, okay? This is not uh, earth shattering stuff here. Below are the reservation requests. So this is kind of a blank table that you could uh, use. So in advance, see, typically that would be filled out, but since this is a BPA, it's, it's kind of like a sample requirement. It's not. Contracting will likely give you that reservation list ahead of time so that you have a more accurate number of rooms. Because at some point, you're going to have to know exactly what's going on, right? And that far in advance, it's hard for them to give it to you. So that kind of explains the table and why it's blank because it's the BPA. But something to, I guess, if you're going to be looking at these type of contracts, something to get used to as a process as it comes to ordering for a specific number of rooms again as it gets closer. Uh, just glancing at my screen, uh, Jita saying, does the contractor has to, has to be, a, the contractor doesn't have to be a hotel. This is small business set aside um, and likely be below simplified acquisition, right? Threshold, likely below 250. We don't, we actually don't know because we don't know how many rooms, but it's, it's quite possible. Just my general experience of, of these types of bids and winning them myself and my students winning them it's very likely beneath that, which means you're you're just looking up with a hooking up with a local hotel. You yourself don't have to be a hotel. But if a hotel wanted to go get registered, first off, the hotel would have to qualify as a small business and they might not, right? Um, or if they're an independent, then then sure, you know. But then they'll have to get a cage code and all that sort of stuff. And then some do, some do do that and beat out everybody else because they just, the, you know, the army or whatever agency goes to them to do these events so often, they can just get the work every single time. So you can't compete with that, but most don't. And that's why most you are able to compete because you're just, you're just competing with another contractor who's doing the same thing as you. But that's, again, that's a, a perfect example of um, self-performing work versus 
versus uh, legal middlemaning. When you self-perform work, you're always going to be more competitive in price, and you're probably going to understand the scope much better and convey that to the government, which means you're going to have a much higher chance of having a more competitive proposal and winning. So self-performing, I think, is always the best. Thing is, most who enter government contracting don't have that level of experience yet, especially in the scope of works that the government buys. So many start out legal middlemaning. It's a great place to get started, right? And then from there, they can either keep doing that or they can start self-performing work or you can start taking over some of the contracts you won by watching the sub and then you can end your contract with them, right? And then you take over the work yourself depending on the terms of your contract. There's a number of ways to go. It's just, it seems in the space, there's this, I'm registered now what? And then you hit this wall and you're stuck for a year or more. You spend a lot of money, you get on a GSI schedule, you go to all these conferences and then you have nothing to show for it. Why not save all that, reduce years into months, get started doing something, build your confidence, build your bank account, right? And build all your capabilities with this stuff, manage the contract, right? You still have to be very involved, even if you're legal middlemaning. And then if you want to expand into more fulfillment or expand areas, you know, we talk about, you know, umbrella uh, strategies and things like this, then you, then you can. The thing is, you have to start somewhere and the industry tries to get you doing everything all at once. And it's too overwhelming. You have no idea what to do. Start out with something that you can and, and build from there. That's just the way the world works. And that's why the strategy works so well, because, we're not like reinventing the wheel here. Like we're learning to walk and then we learn to run. We don't just start out running, doing all this stuff, spending all this money. That's insane. Like start out with something you can handle in a way of, of fulfillment rather that you can handle and then expand, grow by all means, grow into self-performance. I think it's, it's a great thing to do. It's just not something that many can start out doing. Larry says, can you team up with a hotel? That's exactly what I'm suggesting. And that's exactly what many do. You um, you get a quote from the hotel. Absolutely. That's what we're talking about with legal middlemaning. It's another form of subcontracting or uh, working under a teaming agreement. I think we'll go ahead and end it for that bid. We went through all the, the documents, um, didn't necessarily tie it up, but I think we're pretty much there. And I think we have some good questions coming through. Najee says, this is my second live. I love your info, picking up on all the acronyms. Yes, GovCon, learning GovCon is like learning another language. The best way to learn another language is not to read it in a textbook. It's to be in immersion. So again, Najee, thank you so much for that comment because that is what we try to do here. We try to immerse you. I didn't say it at the beginning of the show, but like I don't look at any of these bids ahead of time. I look at them for the first time with you so that we can go through them together. That's a form of immersion. It keeps me on my toes, but also... We, we go through it together and you get to benefit from it in a safety net so that you're not going out and doing it on your own. You get to see me make sense of things, piece the puzzle together, and it don't always make sense. So it's not you. But if you're new and you're not confident, you're not going to have the confidence and be able to stand on your feet to say, it's not me, it's, it's them. Very often it's them. Very often contracting puts things out that don't make sense. They're human. They make mistakes. That's why we submit RFIs. But through our experience of doing this and doing it together... You can build those qualities that will allow you to stand on your two feet, be confident, and, and really go after some, some contracts to grow your business. So, yes, it all starts out with uh, learning the language. In this case, it's definitely like a second language. Cheetah says, first time you're here from Orlando. Hello, everyone, and thanks, Derek. Uh, thanks for being with us. Joan Taylor, first time catching you live as well. So much info. Uh, for the direction I am heading. That's great. Hopefully it's good and usable info. I don't want to have anybody feeling like they're drinking from a, a fire hose. Yeah, typically they'll ask for, you know, to have your pricing in, in line with the per diem rates that are, you know, posted on the government sites. Um, yeah, that is typically a good, a good practice to, to do. Misty, so that unit price is just an estimate. For, so yeah, they had the single occupancy and then the double occupancy. And then they said Fridays and Saturdays, probably because one, that might be where their demand is going to be, like when they do their events or use it. But then also Fridays and Saturdays are also more expensive than the weekdays, right? Anytime you go to a hotel, it can be another 
30, 40% to get a Friday, Saturday uh, night. So the, you're also banking on the, the rates that are higher. That way it's you know going to be all inclusive. How do you execute your agreement with your subs? Well, it's a process. Of, and we talk a lot about this in the book and the, the course, um, if you want to dive more deeply into that. But in a nutshell, you're doing discovery calls. You're reaching out uh, to potential you know, subs and teaming partners to even see if they would be a good fit. And there is kind of an art and a science to that that we cover. Um, but then beyond that, you're submitting quotes, you're submitting your bid, right? And then when the contract goes into place, then you're cutting and, and lining up your agreements with, with your subcontractor um, because you now have a contract in hand with the government that you can move forward. You can't cut a contract to a teaming partner if you don't have the green light to go, right? So it's kind of like those those three steps, right? Discovery, quote, and then agreement. And the way that you do it is you you have a subcontract agreement, teaming agreement, an NDA, non-disclosure agreement, um, which the NDA you can actually do at the beginning of the process because it's you know government contract. But um, I've seen many also include that as part of their their uh, team agreements at the end as well. Do we have to up, uh, update? Yeah, so any so technically, you, the NAICS code does not have to be in your SAM profile, and that's what they would say citing the FAR. But because I've experienced it so many times in the past, I learned when I have a contracting officer saying, hey, I'm trying to award this to you, but you don't have this NAICS code in your profile, you need to hurry up and put it in there. I just like to avoid that, and I just say, yes, put the NAICS code on whatever you're bidding on, Put it in your profile and then do a an, not an annual do a quarterly if or a monthly a monthly might be too frequent but at least a quarterly refresher where you take out the codes you're not regularly using and then you keep the codes in there that you you are using um that way your codes are still um, accurately reflecting the capabilities of your business over time essence says can you give the solicitation info for the bpa uh I'm assuming you would be asking for the notice ID. I will post that in the chat. I don't think it'll it'll post everywhere, but it posts on Facebook, YouTube. I don't think it'll post on LinkedIn. So hopefully you can grab it. Obo says, are there forms that need to be completed between the prime and the sub? Um, yeah, depending on if you're talking about submitting the bid or just between the prime and the sub themselves. That's kind of what we were just talking about with the uh, agreements and NDA and things like that. And again, um, if you want to learn more about that, again, it's in the book. We also have those forms available as part of the Legal Middleman course. Just go to legalmiddleman.com slash course. Um, we have many templates, things that are ready to use, more importantly, ready to customize for you. If you don't have these things or you're worried about not having them, um, that's what makes it very, very valuable. Katina Williams, thank you. Uh, Katina says, we see it. Thanks. Perfect. Cool. Moving on to bid number three. Great questions, guys. Great questions today. And I hope your new year is off to a positive and exciting start. Bid number three, electronics message boards. Air Mobility Command, Air Force, due January 24th, small business set aside. This is Tampa, Florida, with a 541850 indoor and outdoor display advertising NAICS code. McDill Air Force Base is looking to procure two electronic message boards in accordance with the attached statement of need. And attached, we have a clauses attachment, we have an RFQ, and then we have a SON, statement of need, instead of an SOW, statement of work. This is only two pages. Looks like it's going to be pretty uh, short and sweet. My guess is this is going to be a, a pure RFQ, lowest price bid, just by the nature of this. You know, it's not overly, it's not a complicated scope, whereas you would want emphasis on additional evaluation factors other than the price, I would say. So the sixth security force requires a safe way to communicate with the public during large events like air shows, 
open houses, or emergency ops. Having large digital signs that can provide the public with real-time information is critical for public safety. Makes sense. We can picture this. A four foot by eight foot digital message sign with trailer and modem included is what's being asked for. And they're referencing just one CLIN here. CLIN contract line item number. So CLIN 0001 is traffic message board quantity two. Portable matrix message board with modem, model SMC 4000 with trailer or equivalent. So they're literally telling you, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Once again, we know what we want. We need somebody to provide it to us at a fair and reasonable price. And based on that, we will issue an award to whoever's company is most advantageous. To be considered equal, so they're saying, hey, if you're going to do an equivalent, we're technically open to it, but we really know what we want. But hey, if you can find something that's just as good, the product must meet the following salient, functional, physical, and performance characteristics. And I can guarantee you contracting or the end user or the PM went to the website where this model SMC 4000 with trailer, I mean, I don't know. Is Google going to be our friend today? Okay, so we're bringing this to life. I guarantee they went to something like this, and then they copy and pasted it. So the, the game that you kind of play is, where can I find this? Because they didn't make this up. They got it somewhere. I, I doubt it's the, the first one, but I don't know. Maybe it's this one. Energy efficient LED display provides minimal battery maintenance and long operational life. So energy efficient LED. Does this one say that? Energy source, let's go to specifications. Product documents. Could be in the product document. Energy. All right, now we're in the product document. Uh-oh, I think maybe we found it. Energy efficient LED display provides minimal battery maintenance and long operational life. I, I have never seen this before in my life, okay? I'm doing this live with you guys. Energy efficient LED display provides minimal. So we, we found on our first try the exact. So this is what they do. So now you learn, now you know. They just copy and pasted this. Automatic intensity control. Automatic intensity control, industrial grade, like they didn't even mix it up, industrial grade. And that's fine, but this is how you know, like this is like exactly, this is exactly what they're looking for. Quantity two, then you would have to get quote more info. Now this is a little, little too exciting guys, because like this is product and we usually focus on services, right? So this is going to be much more competitive because it's so much easier for you guys to do. Um, and then you're not going to have the advantage of, you know, the year, year on year stacking of contracts, service contracts again. So I don't, I don't want you to like get too, too excited about that, but um, I think it's just a great example. And it's just pure luck that I even pulled that one today. Cause I don't usually, do supply uh pull supply contracts but we did so you know here you have it so now these are all resellers so here's the last piece this is from getbarricades.com they are a reseller they are not the manufacturer so they're putting their markup so aside from your own personal markup that you would put on this to be price competitive i swear i've seen it already where i'm sure this bid is lpta the other thing is you're gonna have to find the retailer that's what is their markup going to be? You're going to have to find the retailer that's putting the more minimal markup that would either give you more space for yours or will just make you uh, more competitive in your, your quote. So that's really the game that you have to play. You have to find multiple resellers of this equipment. Aside from barricades and signs, pops up traffic safety supply co. We've got tap co. We've got Hill and Smith, Trans Supply, Requicorp. Okay. Looks like many places provide this. So it's going to be a lot of smiling and dialing. 
And again, you, you might not even, it's for two. So I'm stressing, I have to stress. Is it, is it kind of worth your time? Might be, might be a fun little way to get into the space, but I'm just telling you, don't spend too much time doing that. You're, if you're at all about the mission that we talk about, you're going to want to switch over to services because supplies is not a good past performance builder. Okay. It's not going to be relevant in the scope. Providing those boards is not going to help you with a janitorial contract or any of the other type of contracts that we're looking at. Um, it's just, it, it could kind of help you go through some of the, the steps and, and, you know, that's, that's kind of about it. It's not going to be sustainable, but that was, it was fun. I mean, it was fun kind of finding that out on the spot. Misty, it depends. Um, it depends if they have a buy American clause in there or not. So it, it depends. Do you know how we can renew Sam? I keep getting emails. Yeah, yeah. You just go into your Sam profile and um, update your entity and do a uh, your annual renewal and update. You just have to renew some of the questions. Um, they may have adjusted FAR clauses, things like that. Uh, reps insert questions. Um, that way your, your, uh, your profile will be current and up to date for the next 12 month period. So it doesn't take a lot of time, nothing to be scared about. It's way, way easier than uh, getting your cage code and all that stuff that you originally had to go through. So hopefully that helps. Next bid, uh, bid number four, locksmith repair service and support maintenance. If you guys, if you're enjoying this, uh, it's definitely smash the like button. And if you're not subscribed, definitely subscribe uh, to the channel. This is due January, uh, January 19th. Is that true? Yeah. Okay. I thought this one was okay. January 19th, small business set aside, 561622 locksmiths. Colorado Springs, Springs, Colorado, place of performance. They're seeking potential sources to provide maintenance services for GSA approved containers and locks. See attached source of saw and PDWS draft. Um, that's kind of uh, old because now this is a full blown bid. For attachments, we have the solicitation, the statement of work, the wage determination. We have what looks like two amendments. So we'll actually start with the solicitation for this one. So first time seeing an SF 1449 form today on this episode. And again, this is locksmith repair services and support maintenance. So we're hit with a pricing clin. Looks like they're just giving you one each for the pricing. Locksmith services as needed and services rendered essentially. So per each. And they give us the delivery information here along with the address at Peterson Air Force Base, Colorado. Yep, everything is just consistent with one each. As you can see, this the format looks slightly, just slightly different than what we're used to seeing, and that's good because it's it's the same uh, structure and layout, but it just looks a little different. Not nearly as different as what we could see with like a VA or a different type of contract, but it's good because the more of these you see, the more confident you you get at finding the same information that you you're always looking for. So we do have an instruction to offer section here any offer who submits an incomplete quote or does not conform will be found non-compliant there we go offer shall assume that the government has no prior knowledge of their experience and capabilities of course offers are advised to submit adequate information to enable evaluators to fully determine your capabilities the quote shall be clear and include sufficient detail the offer is fully expected to perform all objectives in the same of work of course of course the offer agrees to hold your prices firm for 60 calendar days from the date specified for uh, receipt of offers. Amendment. Okay, here we go. So volume one, factor one. And you're thinking, okay, boom. As soon as you see this stuff, you see volumes, you, you see factors, you're thinking proposal outline. This is how my response needs to be ordered. I'm not starting with a blank sheet of paper anymore. I'm going to at least put in these headers and these sections so that I can come and fill them out more specifically or respond to specific questions 
later on with plug and chug. Uh, but at least now we can start with a skeleton. Volume one, factor one, technical capability. Sub factor one, the offer shall provide a detailed plan. Okay, so we need a plan to describe how you will perform the repairs, maintenance, or replacement of these GSA approved containers, locks, and safes. Okay, so that's that technical jargon. You would either be getting through an employee or a teaming partner, depending on how you're going to fulfill this work. They will know the technical portion of how to do this. And specifically, a plan for repairs, maintenance, or replacement. So I'm literally putting bullet points, repair, maintenance, replacement. Okay, we got to respond to each of those. And that will all come together as a plan. Subfactor two, certifications, providing offers ability to work upon GSA certified uh, containers, locks, and safes must be included. Or a plan to subcontract out the work to another small business who is able to do this. There we go. They're literally talking about legal middlemanning as such. And guys, I didn't invent the term. Okay, middlemanning has been thrown around for years. I just got tired of people doing it illegally. So I said, okay, how can I help in this space? Um, okay, well, let's jump in with the jargon that everybody knows, which is middlemanning, and let's do it the legal way, right? And that's builds in the regulations and limitations on subcontracting and compliance and all that good stuff because there's a right way and there's an illegal way to do it. But just to show you here, contracting words, a plan to subcontract out the work to another small business. Okay, it's just the details that matter. Most people leave those details out. Volume two now. So that's volume one, cool. Volume two, factor two, pricing. This section shall include all information regarding the price for uh, from fixed price quote. And that's it. So we have volume one, volume two. We have sub factor one, sub factor two, and then factor two for the price. We have our evaluation offers. That was section L. Now we're into section M. So they are saying most advantageous for factor one. They're talking about an unacceptable, let's see, the technical evaluation duh, 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 is either acceptable or unacceptable. So it's looking like pass fail for factor one. And then factor two, price will be evaluated based on the total contract value in order uh, to determine if the contract price is fair and reasonable. Quotes will be ordered from lowest to highest price. So here's what they're going to do. This is shaping up to be LPTA. They're starting out with the lowest price, and then they're going to look to see if you passed or failed factor one. So they're starting with the lowest price in factor two. Then they're going to look at the factor ones for those who passed. Those who didn't pass, got an unacceptable rating. They're going to move it off to the side. And they're going to in, go up in the price for the bids as much as they have to to get to the offer that has still the lowest price considering, but also passed. I'm probably making it sound more complicated than it needs to be, but it's just the lowest price that is technically acceptable. Lowest price, technically acceptable. And when they get that, so they find that, whatever the lowest price that they can, that's going to be who wins the contract. So if you think you can be that guy or gal, that small GovCon business, then you could submit an offer. And that process is not very specific to that particular bid. That process is typical of all lowest price bids that have a technically acceptable component. Treehouse um, says, as the FAR updates and the LMM strategy evolves, will you keep the course update? Yeah, for sure. Um, the course will definitely be updated. There's been a lot of scrutiny over the SBA over the last couple of years, specifically when it relates to um, limitations on subcontracting. And so I don't expect many changes to come for uh, some time because it's been so scrutinized and the definitions have been so, um, if, you, if you check out the federal, federal register, you can literally find the notes of the entire meetings, which I've read through the, the latest and the greatest for those in the federal register. And you can see um, all of the, the challenges, the considerations, the different ideas that were presented um, specifically by the SBA as it relates to this, and then what the final rulings were on them. So uh, yes, we'll definitely be updated, but don't expect too many updates regarding that specific piece 
and regu regulation um, because there's been so much pressure on it uh, as of late. So it's pretty up. It's it's as updated as it's going to to be at this point. But good question. All right, now bit number five, we do have regulated waste removal and sharps removal. And this is a VA, so definitely touching on different agencies today. This bid is due January 22nd. This is SDVO OSB, consistent with the VA vets first. 562112 NAICS code, hazardous waste collection. And it looks like we just have a solicitation and or an amendment to accompany that. And again, this is at the Durham uh, VA Medical Center waste removal. And if anybody's, when you guys are watching this on Team Replay, definitely love uh, Team Replay in the chat as well. Let me know if you're on Team Replay. So we are hit with the SF1449 form here. And we're introduced to our pricing tables. So we have a base CLIN one for medical waste pickup, but then that's gonna go into sub CLINs. So double A, A, B, A, C, A, D, A, E. Let's see how far this goes. And it's likely gonna be for different locations all the way through A, M. So we have Raleigh, North Carolina pickup. We have Moorhead City, Durham. Okay, so all these sub CLINs are reflecting pricing for their own respective locations. So that's actually nice. They are also telling us the, the POP, the period of performance to begin February 1st. And depending on when this is actually procured and awarded, that POP could change, but it is an indication of probably an existing service that they have, and they don't probably want there to be a lapse in service. So they could always extend an existing contract um, or they go without, but for something like this, I don't think they can afford to go without. But pretty straightforward with uh, the locations and the pricing for each here. So that's really nice to see. And that's gonna be for, mm, so that was CLIN one, then CLIN two is reusable sharps container collection and disposal. So just the straight collection and disposal, and this is uh, monthly. So a monthly price times 12 months for the year. And then the third CLIN is going to be for additional pounds added to cover unique or inpatient and outpatient increase. So almost like a, uh, a miscellaneous kind of catch-all safety net here gives contracting a, a CLIN to go to uh, if additional fundings need to be put on the contract without having to do contract modifications or things like that, that would be more uh, of an administrative burden. This is going to give contracting a built-in go-to as needed. And then we'll see as we go to 1001, we'll see the option years kick in and I'll just do a quick scroll to see, looks like we're at four. So this would be another base plus four for, I don't know, a through M, how many is that? A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, 13. 13 locations, uh, 12 to 13 locations it looks like. Yeah, 13. Um, I, looks like looks good. Then we have to look at the fulfillment piece. How will you or a teaming partner collectively be able to fulfill on this? It's a nice stackable contract for the VA. And the other thing that's cool is when you get in with agencies like this, I use the term get in very loosely does not imply um, ease necessarily or guarantee of additional contracts. But if you think of the needs of this particular VAMC, how many other VAMCs are throughout the country, right? And look at the direct pass performance you have to provide to other VAMCs in the country, right? So no e not necessarily easy or guaranteed, but you can make a pretty good case for providing this and that's heck more than what you typically start out with. And that's the point. So there's the actual full addresses, nice and clear for you to share with your team partner. How many of you guys are doing this? Like, let's just be real. Like, are you, how many of you are actually doing this? Like you're in the weeds. That's why you're watching the show. 
because you're actually doing this versus how many of you are interested in this? You're, you're like, Hey, I heard about this GovCon thing. Maybe I saw this other person on TikTok or whatever, but then I found you. So now I'm watching your video and uh, I'm wanting to learn more about this. And, you know, I kind of like how you present the information. How many of you are kind of at that stage, kind of two different stages, right? One of one group is considering it. Other group is in the weeds and they're looking for gems uh, and maybe even just motivation and the immersion to be in this so that you don't feel like you're doing this alone so that you don't feel like you're doing this on your own because it's as a lonely space right not you know a lot of people actually do know about government contracting but it's not something that's talked about in the mainstream and again i guess mainstream is up to judgment but come on you know what i mean like there's a lot more mainstream stuff than govcon Okay, so we're kind of just getting a feel for the document since it is 82 pages, but we do find ourselves to the instruction to offer as an evaluation factors. So we did find it typically where we should, which is around, I would say around the two thirds mark, if not later in the document. So instruction to quoters, the referencing a site visit, Quote submission. So section A, quote form, is the standard 1449 form, SF 1449. Section B, pricing. We did go through those pricing tables. Section C, reps and certs. Didn't talk about it today, but um, those are actually included as part of your SAM profile, but you can re-answer the questions, refill them out, or download your FAR and DFAR report. Um, I have a separate video on that if you want to check that out so that you have that in a folder because it's a you know good number of pages, 20 to 30 pages. Section D, technical management approach, right? So we're, again, we're seeing these sections. What did I say earlier? You're building an outline. You're putting bullet points. Section E, past performance. So now we're not starting with a blank sheet of paper. We don't have that terror that comes with a blank sheet of paper. Oh, my God, I, I love this. It's a perfect fit for me. Or I, I, I know the perfect teaming partner to go after this, but I don't know how to respond to it. I don't know if I'm doing it right. This is, is the start. This is where your confidence comes from these sections a b c d and e and then for the award basis contracts will be awarded to the quarter with the lowest price technically acceptable so lpta they're saying a rating of acceptable or unacceptable will be assigned to each of the non-price factors so pass fail look at our bullet points past performance it's going to be pass fail management approach okay you either passed it or you failed it same with your quote form, same with your reps and certs, it's there or it's not. And then your pricing. Is your price the most competitive with all those other non-price factors considered? And then that's just gonna be repeated here with the evaluation factors, which is very nice. I like to see them representing this again because it does show the level of importance. And specifically, for example, the prime contractor must provide at least two contracts within the last three years. Do that make them recent and relevant, you will receive an acceptable rating. So if you know that, then this helps you decide, can I do that or not? Because if I can, all right, I'm already getting a pass, you know, check mark on this particular section just at a glance. And then we go into the reps and certs. So pretty, pretty good stuff for today, guys. Treehouse says, in the weeds with two machetes. <laughs> Well, hopefully we can be a third machete for you. Appreciate the honesty and uh, try to be in the weeds with you as much as I can. Shuri also says I'm in the weeds still learning. Uh, that's It's a lot better than being on the sidelines wishing. Okay, there's nothing. It doesn't feel sexy to be in the weeds. It's scary. It's overwhelming. And you're literally going off of whatever little resources you can you know, muster and, and energy and motivation and confidence you can muster. That's why I try to do the, the show for you guys to give you like I said, an additional machete, an additional tool that you can use. Uh, so hopefully being able to be part of this helps. Harvey says, thank you for your whole presentation. You're the first I found to offer understanding without trying to force feed this info through some extreme expensive course. We do have a course. Some may say it's expensive, but I certainly don't try to force feed it. Um, I think the course is way more valuable than, than the price because of what it entails. And it's there for anybody um at whatever stage they're ready but that's why we provide so much value up front because not everybody's at a stage where they can do that so we try to meet you where you're at so i very much appreciate 
um, that comment and sentiment, Harvey Brown. Appreciate it. M says, uh, I've submitted two bids, didn't win. That's actually great. So you want to try to get feedback, get proposal debriefs, or just do a, a, a debrief yourself. I'm not sure if those were quote only or if they had a proposal. But you're at the stage of playing the numbers game, it sounds like. So to know, right, you want to be at 10 to 20 bids for the year um, to win uh, a couple is a good expectation to set. So, you know, you're turning over a lot of stones. You know, you got to kiss a lot of frogs, right? Knowing that's the expectation, when you get to bid four, you're not going to feel like giving up because you're going to be like, oh, man, I'm just getting started, right? Like my my responses aren't even going to start looking good until bids five, six, and seven, right? And then 10 to 20, you're in the money because now you've had experience. You've gotten at least some feedback. Maybe you've had one or two debriefs. You've learned maybe your industry or your niche a little bit better. So you're doing better with pricing. Maybe you're getting better with subs if you're going that route. Maybe getting better at getting more competitive quotes, right? That happens through going through these repetition repetitions. So definitely don't judge yourself after two bid responses. You're you're perfect. I love it. You're exactly where you should be. You just need to keep going. Ten to twenty, you're in the money. Like that's the phrase that I, I want to kind of get you get your expectations aligned with. Because basically, most don't make it to five. Most don't make it past five. I do five and say, oh, this is rigged. I'll never win this. The prices are too low. It's too competitive, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Well, then that just makes it more to go around for the rest of us, right? So don't let that be the case. Uh, make sure that you get your piece of the pie, which means you've got to stick it out and learn. It's not easy, but there is a path forward with this that is doable and it is possible. Jones says, actually working and setting up in this area, staffing healthcare and uh, allied is our experience, trying to find what's the best area to actually work in when funds are limited. Well, you'll be getting paid to do work, so you're not working for free. Um, so when you're talking about the funding issue, if you're talking about, you know, you're not talking about supplies, so you're not upfronting. So then you're kind of looking at a net 60 for maybe the first period, first month into a net 30. So you're looking at having, you know, at least a few months of, of runway of your own personal funds. So depending on how great that is, would be a reflection for the funding that you would need. But for many, it's it's not terrible. Um, then there's also other options like SBA loans or factoring companies as well for financing solutions as you need them. Would you recommend people do sources sought? I don't say things are bad. And if I have, I never meant it. So I don't like to say that things are bad because it's all about timing and it's all about where you're at. So it's my opinion for those who are new in GovCon, new small businesses, say some of you all who are playing the numbers game, I don't think it's the best use of your time right now. I don't think you should get started out brand new responding to source of sought notices because I believe you you don't have a lot of resources to go around time focus attention so I would rather you use that towards something that has more of a direct ROI i.e you can respond to 100 source of sorts you're not going to win any contracts from that um, unless you're doing some sort of 8a sole source or some other form of sole source um, which is a whole other conversation that we don't have here on the channel very regularly but if you took all that effort and put that into bids, even just squeaking by, like doing your best, but not even necessarily doing an amazing job, you could win contracts. So I would rather get you as close to an ROI as possible and, and starting out doing that with source of thought. I just don't think you have the delegation, the time, attention, focus, or experience or skill set to, I really say like a luxury to spend on what I would call a supplemental activity. Right? You're not going to go to the gym and work out and then only take protein shakes. Like you have to be eating real food, right? And then if you need a little bit extra, you want a supplement, you can do that with source of salt, right? Because I believe source of salt, for example, if you already have a semi-full pipeline, source of salt could increase your visibility from, you know, instead of being, you know, 30 to 60 days of visibility uh, to maybe... 90 to 120 days of visibility because you can see further down things coming right but if you've got stuff that's just due right and you've dialed in your searches on sam you've got your umbrella hold uh, you know honed in and it's just you or it's you and your spouse or you and it and a and a business partner 
you don't, you can't take advantage of the 120 day view, right? So starting out, it's like work with what you've got, start with the low hanging fruit, start with what's due now. And then as you build out your systems and, you know, maybe you hire more people, your company grows, you can get a more expanded view. Okay. And that's just one look at source of thought, right? You can do source of thought for marketing purposes and things like that. But at the end of the day, it still doesn't change. You're not going to win anything from responding to a source of thought. You could win something by responding to a bid. It's where I'd like you to start. It's not bad. You see what I'm saying? Like, it's not bad. It's just, is it the right priority? I'm new. I have a cage coat, but I haven't bid yet. That's okay. Things stop people from bidding like imposter syndrome, paralysis analysis. Mental is a big part of this game. And hopefully um, the show can help you out with feeling like you can do this too. Leon says, thanks for actually showing us and providing so much value. Nobody out there is doing this. God bless. Thank you so much, Leon. Um, that's one of the best compliments I could receive. That's exactly what I'm trying to do. So I'm, I'm glad that uh, it does that because I, I, I put a lot of thought in, in, into how I can show up. And so this, this is the decision I've committed to a while back. Emma says, uh, thanks for that. It's a lot of work to get rejected. We'll keep going. It is. It is. But I promise you're, you're in the hardest part. And it's always darkest before the dawn. So it will get it will get harder, it will get darker, and that's what weeds everybody out. So you just have to decide, are you still going to show up even when the walls are crashing down, right? How do you show up in life when, when everything's kind of feeling overwhelming? Are you going to still stand there and persevere? If you do, you become worthy of those rewards. And those are like the rewards in life too. If you run, hey man, like you're, you're, you, you, did, you didn't earn it, right? And some people get lucky and they win their first, second, or third bid, and that's cool too. But it's, it can almost do a disservice sometime to win early because then that becomes your expectation of that it's this easy. And again, it's the mental that gets you. So then you start thinking that's how it should be. And then it's not, it's going to be even harder for you, right? Um, one person can almost, you know, probably relate winning the two bids back in the summer. Now there's that expectation, right? And winning two is, is, you know, twice as many as winning one. So I think the confidence is much higher, but just winning the one, it can almost mess with us a little bit. If it happens too early, we want to have to work for it because it shows us what it really is closer to being like to win. Yeah. Like if you're any of you guys, you're, you're overwhelmed, you, you feel heavy, you feel like this is too complicated. Just keep, keep showing up for the shows, right? But then also take a personal inventory of the other hard things that you've, you've overcome in life and really challenge your why. Why do you want to do this? With all the things you can invest your time and resources into, why this, right? Is it just because you, you saw a flashy like TikTok thing or something like that? If that's the case, you're probably not going to have a strong why. But if you're like, if you're tying this to like, I want to build a legacy business or I want to quit my job, or I want to be my own boss. I want financial freedom. And these are things I've wanted for all these years. And this year is going to be the year I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. If those are things that show up for your why, that's, that's how you persevere. That's what gets you through those dark times when you feel overwhelmed and things are crashing. You need to hit a rock bottom to finally get to that though. Cause this isn't anything that's easy or get rich quick or side hustle or passive income. None of that crap. It's not. This is very real. It's as real as a business in the commercial space. In some, in some ways, it's harder. Some ways, it could be less difficult. But it's not easy. Um, and that what that's what weeds out the most. So hopefully some of these words bounce off of you. Um, you carry with you. You resonate with. Princess Lizzie says hello and thanks for the live shows. Thanks for hanging out with us. Appreciate you. And guys, um, again, we've got the book. We've got the course. We start our class tomorrow. Registration is closed on that, but you can still get into the course and um, that will, the course takes you through the same topics. It's just the class is obviously going to be interactive with me. I'll get the deep dive with the, the students in that. The, the course is going to be self-study at your own pace. That way um, you're not on that time restriction, but you still have things available here to you. And if nothing else, we're doing the shows every week. We're starting the new year strong. So we'll be here for you in whatever way that we possibly can. 
So I think we'll go ahead and end the show here, guys. Smash the like button, subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Great questions, great wins, just so much great stuff on the show. I'm so happy to have you guys, and hopefully you're happy to be part of our community. I'll see you same time, same place next week. Um, take care, guys. Love you all, and see you soon.